Hi friends. So we are at the end of our week, which means that we are almost done talking about books with counting. We're going to read one last book today. Uh, we have been thinking about the question this week of why are numbers and counting important? Um, with our first book, Over on a Mountain, Somewhere in the World, we talked about or we learned that we use numbers and counting to keep track of things. In this case, it was the mothers and the number of babies that each one of them had. Uh, in our next book, in Moja Means One, we learned that numbers tell you how many. It was teaching us the numbers in Swahili and also telling us how many of an object we could find on the page. Um, the last way that we are going to look at today of why these numbers are important is that numbers and counting can show a sequence. Sometimes that might look at look like first, second, third, fourth. But in this case, it is a girl who is walking through a Japanese garden and she's kind of sequencing the events like first this happens, then this happens. And as she walks through the garden and shows up as the steps, she is also counting and noticing uh, the things that are around her. So that is going to be in this awesome book called One Leaf Rides the Wind. And here is our story right here one leaf rides the wind and this book is written by let me look oops the author is celeste davidson manis and it's illustrated by susan kathleen hartung uh, a young girl explores a japanese garden and counts what she sees as she moves through the place i like this book because this is something that you and I can do when we visit a place or even when we're in our own home. We can make observations and we can count what we see. So this is something that you can do at a park. This is something you can do if you're walking along the waterfront or if you're in a museum or in a Japanese garden like this one that they're going to show us. There's lots of places that you can make those observations and count. So um, I have three words. So we are going to look at, like always, we always have vocabulary words before we start reading our book. The first word, oops, I almost dropped it, is the word grasp. I really should grasp my words better because grasp means to grab and to hold on tightly. So if I was grabbing and holding on tightly, I wouldn't have almost dropped it. But I'm going to grasp it really hard right now, grasp it tightly so that it does not fall before I tape it on. The word grasp, to hold on tightly. The next word I have is the word miniature. Miniature. And miniature simply means a smaller version of something. In this book, we are going to be looking at tiny trees, and we call those miniature trees. They are little, short, smaller versions of something. Um, my parents used to have a little wiener dog. Those are also called dachshunds. Um, but he was a miniature dachshund, a miniature wiener dog, which meant that he was smaller. He was still very long, like a hot dog, but he was a smaller uh, version of that dog. He was only like, I don't know, like eight pounds or something instead of the regular 20 pounds that that dog usually is. So he was a miniature dachshund, which means that he was smaller. In this book, we're talking about small trees. They are definitely not taller than us. Miniature. And our last word, I actually like how this word sounds. The word is adrift. Just say that word nice and calmly, adrift. It actually sounds to me like what it means. And adrift means floating without being steered. So if you set a boat adrift, then you would simply push it out into the water and just let it go. And it would just flow wherever the current or the wind would take it. Um, sometimes that's a good thing. And sometimes that's not a good thing. Especially if we're talking about boats, we don't really want them to go adrift. We want to be able to control where they are going. Um, in this case, we're talking about something else. So adrift isn't such a bad word but we're letting it glow, F floating without being steered, adrift. Great, so let's start our story. 
One leaf rides the wind. Something special about this book before I start is that it's written in a special poetry called haiku. And a haiku um, is, like I said, a really specific kind of poetry where you write where you have different syllables. There's a lot of rules about what a haiku is. And you actually have so many syllables that you are allowed to use on each line. There are three lines and the first line has five syllables. So when we're talking about syllables, that's how many parts in a word. Like the word syllable, we chunk it up to syllable. So it has three syllables. So in a haiku, you can use five syllables. Those can all be one words, like once I went to play. Once I went to play. Because each one of those words is a single syllable, so you can use lots of words. But if you are using a word like syllable, syllable, well, you don't have very many chances to use other words. So you have to be really creative when you're adding these or creating these haikus. The second line, you can have seven syllables, so it can be a little bit longer. And then the third line, you go back to five. So it goes five, seven, five. And so you'll see that in this story where it's following that pattern of a haiku, and it's really fun. So. All right, here's our picture. One, one leaf rides the wind. Quick as I am, it's quicker, just beyond my grasp. At the bottom in this book, there's also more information about each part of the Japanese garden. So then I'm going to read the foot. These are called footnotes. That means it's a note about what's the book, about what's something on that page. And I'm going to share that too. It says, within the burnished depths of an autumn leaf, is the story of seasons past and seasons yet to come. So it's talking about how this leaf holds a really important story about life cycles. Two. Two carved temple dogs snarling over my shoulder. Sit, guard the garden. Long ago, Buddhist monks trained Shih Tzu dogs to guard their temples. Today, temple dog statues flank the entrances of gardens and temples, talismans against disasters, such as fire, flood, and earthquakes. That means that these statues are kind of like good luck charms to keep those bad things from happening. Three. Suddenly, I'm tall. Suddenly, I'm tall. So they can only use a couple more words. A miniature forest. Three pots on a wall. Bonsai is the art of growing trees in pots or trays. Through careful trimming and wiring, the beauty of a full-grown tree is recreated in miniature. Often called heaven and earth in one container, bonsai celebrates the harmony possible between man and nature. People take really, really delicate care of these really intricate trees. They're really cool to look at, especially the ones that kind of look like this one, where they kind of grow and have almost layers to them. Here's our next page. Ooh, look, I like the how it's showing like she's looking up. I like that. Four. From eaves to blue skies, four startled birds take flight. Shoo! A cat prowls the roof. Hopefully they all get away. Do you see four birds? One, two, three, four. Shinto, the native religion of Japan, teaches respect for nature in its many and varied forms. Kami are spirits believed to dwell in all natural things. Animals, plants, rocks, water, and the sky are homes for these spirits. So everything has a spirit and a meaning. Five. Smiling Pagoda. 
five roots, five roofs stretch to the heavens. We shelter beneath. Look at this. This is all, see all the roofs? The gently upturned roofs of the pagoda stand for earth, water, fire, wind, and sky. With its soaring silhouette, the pagoda is a prominent feature of the garden and a favorite place to pray or meditate. So when we meditate, kind of like when we take our mindful moments at school, people can go to a pagoda and have that quiet, mindful moment for themselves. Six. Outside the tea house, six wooden sandals gathered neatly in a row. Before entering the tea house, guests place their shoes on the kutsunugi teishi, or shoe receiving stone. Shoes are removed before entering the tea house to honor the purity of the tea ceremony. So it's kind of a ritual. You go in and you sit down and there are steps to how the tea is served during the tea ceremony. So the shoes are on the stone. Seven. On a lacquered tray, seven sweet surprises lie. Hungry tummies growl. See all those really yummy looking treats? I see seven, do you? Every movement and gesture of the tea ceremony reflects the principles of harmony, respect, purity, and tranquility. The tea master prepares frothy green tea and a simple meal. Sweet cakes made from rice, soybean paste, or pureed chestnuts are molded into the shapes of seasonal flowers, fruits, and leaves and served after the meal. So kind of like a dessert. Eight, what do flowers dream? A drift okay. on eight pond pillows, pink-cheeked blossoms rest. See all of our lilies? Oh, those are lotus flowers. I'm sorry, those are not lilies. I was thinking lily pad, but those are lotus. White, yellow, and pink lotus flowers flourish in ponds. Their plump blossoms perch to top floating leaves or pads. They represent purity and mirror the soul's ability to reach beyond muddy waters to the sunlight of a better existence. So she's resting and thinking about finding happiness. Nine, hoping for some crumbs, they nibble at my fingers. Nine, glittering koi. You see them? They're kind of hard to see, so I'm going to get real close for you to see all nine of them. Koi fish are admired for their colorful appearance and hardiness. They are also a popular symbol of determination and strength. Ancient legend tells of a koi fish that struggled up a huge waterfall in order to be transformed into a dragon. What? Into a dragon? That's awesome. And 10. 10 lanterns waiting. When darkness falls, they sparkle, pleased to light the way. Do you see all the lanterns? Delicately carved stone lanterns are displayed throughout the garden. In the evening, their twinkling lights help guide visitors, illuminating a branch here, a bit of path there, helping them find their way. One leaf rides the wind. Quick as it is, I'm quicker. I reach for the sky. So it's showing all the parts of the Japanese garden. Hmm. 
The final page has a little bit of information about a Japanese garden and about haiku, the type of poetry that is present in this book. I'll give you a moment to think about it. Okay. So what I want you to do today is after we've looked at all these counting books, um, I want you to make your own counting book. And so I want you to use the chart that I gave you on Seesaw or in the packet. And I want you to think of a way for you to, to make a counting book. What kind of counting book do you want to make? So you could do a collection of things that could be similar to uh, somewhere on a mountain or it's not somewhere on a mountain, sorry, over on a mountain somewhere in the world. It's just such a long name for a book, Ooh, but I wanted to make sure I got it right. Over on a mountain somewhere in the world where I had a collection of animals and then each animal had, or each animal mom had a number of babies and they counted on one more each time. So you could do a collection of things or you could do something kind of like what we see in One Leaf Rides the Wind, where you are looking and making observations about one place. Maybe that's a park, maybe that is your own home, maybe that is somewhere else that you might be interested in looking and counting things. So I started one for myself to give you an example, and I just decided to look around my apartment and think like, what could I look at in my apartment? And I named it, I see, in my apartment, and it says by Miss Rose. And I only did like three three things, just to kind of get started to show you an example. I looked around my apartment and thought really hard about what do I see different numbers of things? And one thing I noticed is that I have one hermit crab. That's a recent thing, I know, it's really sad, but we have one hermit crab left. Um, so I wrote one, and then I wrote one hermit crab. And there's Hermie. Still kicking it. He's crawling all over the place. Um, and then I looked around and looked, well, what, what, what might be in my apartment that I might have just two of? And I found two plants. So I wrote two, two plants. And then I drew a picture of my two plants. They're sitting right under the radiator or on top of the radiator, but under the window so they get lots of light and sun because they are from the classroom and I have to take care of them so I can bring them back. Um, and then I looked around and I said, three. Well, I have three balls of yarn that are sitting on uh, a table right over here, right by where I sit, because they are attached to all the different knitting projects that I am working on right now. So three balls of yarn. If I looked around, I'm sure I could find four of something. I'm sure I could find five of something. Um, I could sure I could find 10 of something. If anything, I could just count this like stack of books. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Well, look right there. There's 10 books in that stack. Just that one tiny stack. I could say 10 books in one stack. And I could use that as an example. Or I have, uh, if I look around here right now, I can count uh, one, two, three, four, four in my living room, different Nessies. Because we know I love the Loch Ness Monster. So my next one might be four Nessies, you know? And, and so I can look around just my apartment and find that even just my living room. So I know that you can look around and find that in your home or you can go outside and count all the different types of flowers that you see or any number of things. So be super creative and make a counting book of your own. It doesn't have to be full sentences. Uh, mine is not, it's just, it's more like Moja means one. Although that was one full sentence on each one, but I want to see the number and I want to see what it is. Okay. And some sort of picture to go with it. If you want to write a full sentence or more, that would be awesome to see. I can't wait to see your work. Thanks. Bye.